Hi, Matthew Holt here with the THCB Spotlight. I'm here with my old friend Sarah Brubacher, who uh, has done some stuff in her life and has a very exciting new book to talk about. So, uh, Sarah, when I knew you way the hell back in 2000 and then, something, uh, hang on, put that down for a second. No, I've got to say, you were, uh, you were working <laughs> at eBay and ended up working at eBay in Silicon Valley for uh, 14 years, 15 years. I've done some stuff. 14 startup. years. Right, a long time. Uh, so, Silicon Valley startup executive, uh, all that kind of good stuff. And then at some point in your life, things took a left turn. Hence yes. the book which you just showed us. All right. So uh, you've out with a new book, and your book is called The Cancer Channel. And you had you were very selfish. You had two forms of cancer at once because one wasn't enough. So tell us a little bit about what happened to you. Yes, I, I'm greedy, and and we know that. I uh, was changing roles. I had been running a very large team, and I moved into an individual contributor role. It was actually a pretty large promotion. And uh, I took some time to go uh, see some doctors, and I had a lump in the floor of my mouth that I was concerned about. I spoke with my dentist. She said, well, it's either an infection or there's this really, really rare form of cancer, but I'm sure that's not it. <laughs> so uh, I, I started speaking with a number of specialists and spoiler alert, it turned out it was that really rare form of cancer. It's called adenoid cystic carcinoma, or as I like to call it, badass salivary gland cancer. And um, you've, of course, never heard of it before because no one has it. Only 15,000 people a year are diagnosed with it. So I was I was one of those lucky few, as I was taught about the cancer and about the treatments for the salivary gland cancer, I said to my head and neck doctor, you know, hey, about six years ago, I found a lump in my breast. And um, I, uh, you know, talked with my OBGYN and we did a mammogram and we ended up doing a biopsy and I was told that it wasn't cancer. But is it possible that it's actually metastatic adenoid cystic carcinoma? And he, he said, Sarah you already have one of the rarest forms of cancer there is. So the chance of there being two cancers, because to be clear, adenoid cystic carcinoma, when it metastasizes, it goes to the lungs or the brain, you know, which I, I found really reassuring. He said, <laughs> well, go to the, the lungs or the brain. So if you were to have um, cancer in your breast, it would be a separate cancer, a primary source cancer. And Sarah, we just never see cancers like like this in someone so young, go back to your OBGYN and, and have it biopsied again. So, you know, fast forward, when I did that, uh, I discovered I had stage three breast cancer, that I had been misdiagnosed previously, and that at this point, it was in my lymph nodes. All right, so you're trying pretty hard here, you have a couple of cancers. Um, and this is, uh, how long ago are we talking? How long ago was this? So this was 10 years ago. So I'm now I'm now 54, but I was 44 at the time. And I you'll remember I had just gotten married yep. and we were going through fertility treatments at the time. In fact, I was scheduled for IVF one week after I was meant to have one week after I was diagnosed with the salivary gland cancer. So it was just it was just a very rough time. So of course we had to initially delay the IVF. And then what I came to discover in talking to my breast oncologist, um, once I got the breast diagnosis, the the, um, uh, the breast cancer diagnosis, she called my husband, Jeff, and me back to the office. And she said, I understand you've been pursuing fertility. And we said, yes. And she said, well, what have you heard about your fertility given the cancer diagnoses? And I said, you know, well, I understand that I'll be going through treatments for at least the next year. And that two years after that, if we haven't seen more cancer, I can pursue IVF. And she looked at the two of us and she said, she said, um, once we're finished with your active cancer treatment, I'm going to put you on a hormone suppressing drug called tamoxifen and you'll be on it for 10 years, Sarah. And so you'll be 54 when I take you off it and you won't be a candidate for IVF at that point. So I'm sorry, there are many ways to have a family, but you will not be able to carry a child, which, um, you know, strangely enough, 
we weren't convinced that I was going to survive the year, given the salivary gland cancer can be really, really aggressive and it's incurable. And then here I had breast cancer. So all of that was wacky. But somehow hearing, you know, a definite no on the fertility was really, um, it was heartbreaking for us. Um, but then I will share with you um, two years post treatment um, when we were feeling bullish that I might live <laughs> because the cancer hadn't come back. Um, I was at my two year uh, medical appointment with my oncologist and I said, you know, Jeff and I are optimistic. And so we are looking into surrogacy. And she said, oh, Sarah, I'm so glad you bring this up. She said, because there has been um, a recent European study and there were these very willful German and Belgian women who, against the best wishes of their doctors, went off their tamoxifen, got pregnant, had babies, went back on their tamoxifen and didn't have higher incidence of recurrence. Wow. And I said, so I, I was like, so what are you saying to me? She said, if you want to have a baby, let's try it. And so... <laughs> And so at, uh, so I got pregnant at 47 and I gave birth to my daughter, Rory, at 48. Wow. Okay. So you've been through a hell of a lot in the last, uh, well, decade, but certainly, you know, <laughs> way back, back then, the last few years. And also I met Rory and she's a quite, quite little character. Um, so, uh, and, <laughs> and uh, you have, you have a, you, you have a, uh, how do I, how do I put this politely? You have a very, uh, a, a very uh, understanding and, and, and polite husband, <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> so, um, so he is. I, he's been. He's been terrific support. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So let's. So now, fast forward. Uh, this week, you're publishing a book. Show the book again. Oh, is now the time? Is now, now the appropriate time? time? This is why right. it's called. The, it's called the Cancer Channel. Um, tell us. You know, so a lot of people people go through through cancer. You went through two at the same time. Yeah. Obviously, you talked to us a little bit about your experience uh, in, of, of of the treatment and what happened. And the good news is that you're a still here, and and b that you know you you, uh, you the the, the tamoxifen thing going off and going back on and getting pregnant worked, and you have a lovely daughter. Um, but why a book? What's what 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 about it is is that you wanted that you wanted to share given. You know, there's a lot talked about cancer and a lot of experiences, but but why 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 did you why did you go to that part of it? Yep. So um, a, as you kind of highlight, it's kind of a wacky, wild story, um, kind of not to be believed. And the other kind of thread in the story that you and I haven't um, uh, hit on is while I was getting my cancer diagnoses, my father had um, had prostate cancer had been diagnosed with press prostate cancer eight years prior and um his his cancer in remission came back and so while i was going through my cancer treatments my father was also going through um now more aggressive cancer treatments for him uh because his his cancer had metastasized to the bone uh bones so he was um stage four uh prostate cancer so Interestingly enough, while, um, you know, while you wouldn't wish a cancer diagnosis on anyone, um, it was for both my father and me kind of an amazing experience to have someone we were so close to going through it with us. So it was kind of strange, but I had a cancer buddy and somebody that I could talk to very openly and honestly about it. So that was that was an interesting aspect of it as well. But you you brought up, oh wow, Sarah, you know, two cancers and then you had a baby. The the tagline <laughs> for the cancer channel is one year, two cancers, three miracles. And the three miracles is at the beginning of that year, it was looking like I could die from either one of those cancers and I most certainly wasn't going to have a child. But the, at the end of it all, I am no evidence of disease for the salivary gland cancer, no evidence of disease for the breast cancer. And I have a six-year-old, very feisty little girl. Amazing. So okay. why did you decide to write a book about it? And what's in the book that, uh, that, other than that, that, that tells you a story, but what else is in the book? <laughs> um, I decided to tell the story because I, I um, while I was going through cancer treatments, 
Um, I am one of those people that uh, if I don't understand something or want to learn more, you know, I really dive into books. And in 2012, I could not find a book um, that explained the lived experience of going through cancer treatments. I found some, I mean, there are some, you know, just great textbooks that were very much beyond my mental capacity um, to understand. And then there were some good textbooks written or good uh, kind of primers written by doctors who were explaining exactly what cancer is um, and what the various treatments do. But I couldn't find a book where um, a cancer patient was describing in detail how different things felt. And um, and not just physically, but also um, emotionally and psychically. So I originally, Matthew, started to write a guidebook for the newly diagnosed. And, and I did. I wrote a guidebook for the newly diagnosed. And knowing nothing about publishing, I suddenly started reaching out to anyone I knew who might know someone in publishing. And I spoke to about half a dozen people in the publishing industry. Um, and uh, they all read excerpts from my book and they were like, um, nobody writes an entire book anymore and publishes it. Like they don't, they don't do that. You write a proposal. Um, but I was like, well, I, I didn't know. So I wrote it. And they said, um, you know, um, no one is going to read a book from a cancer patient. No one's going to read a guidebook from a cancer patient. They will only um, read those from doctors. Uh, so this won't be successful. But I had actually written two memoir chapters, one at the beginning and one at the end of the guidebook to kind of um, give context to why I was writing the book. And they said, I'm going to I'm going to air quote, sorry, you have a great voice. You're funny. You should write a memoir. And I, it's like um, a memoir uh, sounds arrogant and self-absorbed. And, and I hope I am neither. I said, but um, would would people read it? And they said, it's an interesting story, try it. And so I thought, well, I, if it's helpful and if it explains the lived experience to cancer patients, to people who are newly diagnosed or the people who love them, um, then yeah, I'll do it. Um, and so I did, though it took me 10 years <laughs> to write the book because I kept setting it down. You know, I, I started it during um at the end of my my cancer treatments and then set it down when I went back into my chief of staff role at eBay and then didn't pick it up again until the end of my maternity leave and then set it down again until I thought I was having a recurrence of my cancer three years later thought I was having a recurrence and I asked um I asked the folks at at, at eBay the CEO um, hey, can I take a leave of absence to go finish this book? And and he said yes, and they said yes, and were very supportive. And I set it down again um, when I went to work at a startup after eBay. I went to uh, I became COO at a startup, and when I left that a year ago, I said, okay, I got to you know, if, if my cancer comes back, one of the biggest regrets I'll have is not having written this book. Let me just get serious about it and let me write the damn book. And so I said to my husband, I am not going back to work. I'm going to write, the, I'm going to finish the book. And that's what I did. And so thankfully I'll go back to work now. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. So um, what about the experience of going through cancer, going through treatment? We hear a lot about it. I have on, uh, on TCB, I've had, uh, you know, I have the, the, the TCB gang. I've had an entire session with cancer survivors and people who've been can cancer caring, talking to you know people who are trying to build new types of cancer, uh, cancer concierge companies and others. There's yeah. a lot of experience out there in the online world of people who have a lot of stuff written and talked about, and there's been cancer online groups forever. What about the uh, cancer experience? Do you think people who are you know diagnosed with cancer don't know what it what What are the lessons that you know you wish you could impart? Mm. Um, you know, the, the first thing is you, you read a lot about side effects, Matthew, like, um, you know, th there's like a page long list of all the side effects for chemo, for radiation, sure. et cetera. And that can be a pretty terrifying list. Um, 
uh, as you're approaching your cancer treatments because you don't know how your body is going to react. Um, and I think one of the things to remember is every body is different. So just because something is listed as a side effect doesn't mean your body is going to experience it. And so, you know, th that's the first thing, like, and I think that's where just a lot of the fear is associated, like, you know, what sort of physical punishment or physical indignities am I going to need to bear to try to save my life? And so the first thing is like, not, not every, not everything is going to relate to you. Number two, um, I always try to remind myself that there were two sides to the statistics. Like one of the things they tell you don't do, which everybody does, is you will Google, what are the statistics of survival for my kind of cancer? And in the case of my adenoid cystic carcinoma, in the case of my salivary gland cancer, you know, <clears throat> after five years, 80% of people are still alive. After 10 years, it drops to 32%. And that's scary, right? And uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma is incurable. They, we don't currently have a cure in great part because there's not been a lot of research done on, on this rare cancer. And I mean, I mean, I totally get it. Like, you know, researchers are gonna spend time where the cancers are most popular, where the most people are being diagnosed and and the greater number of people need help but um just remembering your remembering to yourself there are two sides to the statistics um and 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 believe that you will be on the side that will that will ultimately survive number three and, I, and i'll just do three but i i can i can talk ad nauseum as you know okay um <laughs> number three is um I found the emotional psychic battle to be as difficult, if not more difficult than the physical battle. I have a very, very high threshold of pain and cancer challenged that. I, I, had, um, I had over 20 sores in my mouth and it was as if my um, whole mouth was sunburned and me who's obsessed with eating and food and went to culinary school i mean that's how obsessed i am with food um i couldn't eat for three weeks i physically couldn't eat because i was in so much pain um but in when i think about my year of cancer what i remember is um how scared i was and the mental anguish i felt when i was first diagnosed the the terror and and matthew i i just describe it uh, in detail in the book. And um, my, my strong recommendation um, for people who have been newly diagnosed is um, that uh, you recognizing how your mental health is impacted by a diagnosis, by a life-threatening diagnosis. And this, this applies to things beyond cancer, but it's okay to go ask for help. Um, whether it is um, medication, like in my case, I went to my breast oncologist and I said, I am in constant fight or flight. I feel visceral, palpable fear yeah. every hour of every minute that I am awake currently. And I am convinced that I will die of a heart attack <laughs> before either cancer will ever get to me could you help me out? <laughs> and she did. She, she, um, she prescribed an anti-anxiety pill that, um, are we allowed to swear on your, of course you can. Yes. Okay. So I called it the, uh, my pill, I called it the get the fuck over it. You have cancer pill. <laughs> and I took my get the fuck over it. You have cancer pill every day around four o'clock which you're, you're a father, you have two um, feisty yeah. children, children of your own. And, um, I, you know, it's the witching hour for children. And I found it was the witching hour for me. It was when I was in the most acute psychic emotional pain. Yeah. And so I would take it and it would just take the edge off yeah. enough that, um, and, and concurrent with that, 
A lot of people seek therapy, which I think is terrific. Um, and I turned to Eastern practices. So my very good friend, Tripti, who is a yoga instructor, uh, when I told Tripti about my diagnosis and I was telling her about some of the amazing doctors I was working with at Stanford, she said, Sarah, that's team one. That's your Western medicine um, team. I'm going to be in charge of team two, which are your Eastern practices. And so, you know, I, I think you knew me uh, pre-cancer, Matthew. I was not someone who had patience for meditation or yoga or any of that stuff. <laughs> right. And and I made time and space for it in my life. And I started doing yoga regularly and I started doing meditation and energy work and acupuncture. And I started out saying, well, it can't hurt. You yeah. Know? It might help. And it did. And what I learned was how to center my breathing. What I learned was how to calm down the fight or flight. And um, that is what got me through the cancer treatments. And just to make another leap, I believe that in being more relaxed and kind of accepting and uh, accepting of the cancer diagnosis and just saying, I'm going to do the best job I can here. I believe my body was more receptive to the medicine. I just do. And I will tell you that beyond, you know, as I've gone on beyond, I've become a different executive. Like um, I am somebody who's, I, I'm still intense. I get that. <laughs> but but I, I can relax and, and I can slow my breathing and I don't, I'm not re reactive as much as I am proactive now. And so it's really, for me, it, you know, been an amazing change to my life. Amazing. So those are the things. No, that's, that, that's amazing. So let me ask you one other thing uh, before we wrap, which is obviously, and you know, I've done this for 30 years and you know that, uh, you know, there is this big beast called the healthcare system and it does industrial scale stuff to people particularly, you know, um, people with chronic illness and people with cancer, as you know, as you mentioned, Stanford, uh, a big machine. And a lot of people get lost in the big machine. And uh, what was your experience of, you know, the machine in the U.S. healthcare system in all its aspects dealing with you? And given your experience as, you know, a Silicon Valley executive, do, were there changes? Was there, was, was there good stuff? Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you think about the sort of state of play of you know the human experience in the big system of US healthcare. Matthew, I cannot begin to tell you how much I love this question because this is a lot of the point that I make in the book. Um, to be clear, I was misdiagnosed at one of the top medical centers in the country. I was misdiagnosed. And there was a lot that went completely sideways in that experience. And as somebody who has worked with customers regularly, I know that sometimes with customers, people make mistakes and things go sideways. And you know what? It's not personal. No one, no one who misdiagnosed me or had a part in any of that, none of them were looking to harm me. None of them were looking to make that mistake. Absolutely not. Um, when I went to Stanford, one of the things I did to ensure that my care was coordinated uh, is that because I, I had like two, well, two primary cancer teams, but a whole bunch of ancillary teams involved as well. So I got everybody's email address. And every time I would email one doctor, I CC'd all the rest. Um, and I will tell you now, uh, Stanford has a terrific um, uh, electronic system where you can email people now. Um, and it's, it's, you know, <clears throat> seems to be good and they do seem to be coordinated and Stanford takes this very seriously. Every time I go there, I get a survey afterward asking about my experience. And, uh, but I felt um, I needed to project manage everything in my care. And I, you know, I clearly I had, uh, I got a second opinion after everything that had happened at the first medical center, you know, I, so I questioned the doctors. I went to every appointment with a list of questions and I made sure that I followed everything up. I emailed everybody. I CC'd everybody. I 
uh, I parallel processed everything I could in part because I know I'm the person that cares most about my care. And it's not that my doctors don't, it's just they have so much going on. So I need to be the best project manager I can. And I need to be as respectful as I can, but I do need to question things. Um, it, it would be easy. I, I, I would say if you're already going through the many stages of grief associated with a cancer diagnosis, which includes denial, like that's one of the five stages, right? Denial. I know of people who have known they have a lump and they're like, oh God, I don't want that to be cancer. And so they ignore it. Right. But I will say with cancer, um, early detection <laughs> and early intervention lead to better outcomes very often. So, you know, I, I encourage people to be as proactive as they can be. Um, get second and third opinions. Doctors make mistakes. Doctors don't know everything. That's why they call it practicing medicine. <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, my advice to people is, yeah, the healthcare system is is hard and complex and peopled um, with humans and with fallible systems. So you need to stay on top of it. You need to coordinate with everybody. You need to ask a lot of questions and you need to take care of yourself. Did you find, or do you think, or do you think over the years it's changed and there are more services for patients who aren't type A, you know, um, Cornell MBA, <laughs> it's talking about executives who are going through this that can help them? Or do you think that patients are still kind of on their own? Um, I, I know it's, you know, and, you know, my experience is- Nothing wrong with being a Cornell MBA Silicon Valley executive, that, just to be clear, but you know, you are one on everyone else's. <laughs> um, I, I, I only know kind of the medical centers I've been a part of, and um, what I will tell you is Stanford has a concierge service. They have, um, uh, I believe, they have patient advocates, or a lot of um, uh, a lot of medical centers have patient advocates. In fact, actually, when my father was going through his cancer treatments, he was also having some heart issues. And so I suggested that he seek out a patient advocate in order to coordinate his care and ensure that his medicine, his multiple medicines weren't causing issue um, for him. Uh, so people can look for patient advocates. I will also say um, that uh, the, you know, again, at Stanford, and this is not a commercial for Stanford, but I think there are some best practices here. There's not a time that I visit my breast oncologist that she doesn't ask about all of me and how everything is going because they try to treat the whole person. And I have to say the, the medical center that originally misdiagnosed me, it's actually, I went back to them when I had my child. I actually had my child through that medical center. Um, because that was what was recommended to me by my fertility doctor. She said, go there. It's, it's closest to you. And they've now adopted a lot of the best practices I've seen at Stanford. Like I now get surveys from them. Uh, my doctor was very high touch and always checked in to see how I was doing during the pregnancy. So I think there are some best practices. I, I was encouraged, um, to see that, um, so I, I hope so. I hope people are paying more attention. I also hope they're starting to pay attention to the link between mind and body. Um, I uh, One of the you know team two practices that I adopted uh, during my cancer treatments was I did what's called guided imagery, which maybe you've heard of. And it was my fertility, my Stanford fertility doctor who said, Sarah, I don't, I don't know if you buy into the link of mind and body, she said, but I do. And she said, and something that might be helpful for you is to do guided imagery um, to help you do process and grieve this cancer diagnosis. And oh my goodness, Matthew, it was amazing. You know, and this was again, as the cynic, and I was like, all right, I have a cancer diagnosis. I'll try anything. I found it a tremendous, critically helpful. Fantastic. Um, last question. So, what are you? Uh, uh, what are you doing to uh, not only promote the book and also you put the story out, but, but to share the story? What other kinds of things are you 
that you're doing, what do you hope to be able to do and hope to be able to 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 to, to, to say and connect with other people who are either going through cancer, have gone through cancer or about to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in the book, I share the story of six months after I came back to eBay after my cancer treatments, I was asked by um, the head of HR at StubHub to come speak at StubHub. And they were doing a um, some uh, people manager training and they were trying to build their empathy in their people managers. And so Anne, uh, the head of HR said to me, Sarah, if you're willing to do it, we'd love to have you come in and speak to a group of 150 people managers about what it was like to be diagnosed with cancer. And then we'd like you to answer their questions. Are you game? And I said, uh, yeah, yes, I think so. Um, <laughs> let's see how it goes. And I said, and, and if I break down crying, I said, because I, I still can't trust myself. If I break down crying, just please understand you take over. I said, but let's see how we do. And I will tell you, Matthew, I, I went into this group and it was 150 people I didn't know. I mean, I was over at eBay and eBay and PayPal were, uh, eBay and StubHub were related, but there wasn't a huge crossover between people. And so I went into this room of strangers and I, I told very vulnerable stories and I tried to make them funny where I could and vulnerable where it was appropriate. And I looked out into the audience and there were people, some people doing this, some people doing this. And there were at least two people who left the room. And as I was talking, I thought, this is so weird. They don't even, they don't even know me. Why would they be having this reaction? And then I was like, oh, right, Sarah, because it's not about you. Like what you're talking about is resonating for them, for them or for somebody that they love, or maybe for an employee. And um, I thought, wow, this is, this is powerful. And after the talk, and I know you've given a lot of talks, so you know, you know how everybody storms the speaker afterwards. So Afterward, people came up and the first group of people who came up, they were like, you're really funny. <laughs> you told great stories. But, and of course, you know, you always love to hear that. Number two was, um, uh, wow, you talked about really, really personal things in a professional setting. That was super surprising. Like, what else are you going to tell us? <laughs> yeah. The, the third group was, um, you know, managers who said, wow, you made me think differently about how I show up as a manager. And I was like, huzzah, can you go tell Anne that? Because I think we just, yeah. we just accomplished what you want. And then the last group of people were people were the people who had left the room. Yeah. Um, and they were saying, you know, hey, my dad has cancer. Can I talk to you about it? And I, Matthew, I was so surprised. And the managers in the room told Anne, they're like, oh my God, this is the best training you've ever had. So I, they actually flew me out to Connecticut to meet with even more people managers. And, and it was just tremendous. And people were like, this is so helpful. And I thought, this is what I want to do. And so um, I am hopeful that what I will do next is go um, speak with companies. And, and um, I am speaking with a number of former colleagues from eBay who are now at other companies and they've you know, I did a lot of speaking when I was at eBay, so they've they've seen me before and and hopefully, you know, think I'm funny. Um, but, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm really hopeful that I will be brought into companies to talk about um, what it's like to work with employees who are in crisis. Like, how do you show up for them? And um, so that that is what I'm hopeful is next. I also am involved with the Adenoid Cystic Carcinoma Organization International, ACCOI. And the president of that organization has asked me to start speaking at medical conferences. Because I will tell you, Matthew, I have a couple of friends who are doctors. And they were like, hey, can we get a copy? Can I read your book? And um, they experience the book differently than just the regular friends. Like uh, my friend, my friend Lyra, who wrote one of my reviews on on Amazon, and actually she wrote one of the the um, endorsements. She was like, "This this impacts me as a clinician." She's like, "I I am I am sitting with this and thinking about what Sarah's described," and she's like, "I just wish all doctors would read this." So I mean, between the companies and the medical conferences, like I'm just I'm just super helpful and and super hopeful. And in fact, I will I will tell you. Matthew, as I think about it, you were actually one of the first people who, when I told you I was writing a book, you were like, 
have you thought about talking um, at medical conferences and things? Because you told me it would actually be super helpful. So I actually need to give you credit for that. <laughs> you know me, I'll take credit from anywhere I can get it, especially from yourself. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, that's amazing. So congrats on getting the book out after only 10 years. <laughs> and uh, congrats on all that's happened to you. And thanks for doing it. I'm so glad you're still here and with us. And uh, that uh, Rory and Jeff get to hang out with you a bit more. Well, I guess, I guess Rory might not have hung out at all. So without it, so that's amazing and, uh, and, and wonderful. So the book is The Cancer Channel. It's Sarah. It's on the it's Sarah Brubach. I'm not McDonald. I can never remember what your name is. Sarah McDonald. I know it's very, very confusing. When you knew me, I was Sarah Brubacher. I am now Sarah McDonald, but you can find me as both like out on LinkedIn. Okay, sorry. So, no, no, let's, let's get this right. The cast down from Sarah McDonald. I thought you were both for a while, but uh, fantastic. And uh, look, uh, that's out, and you can get it at Amazon and other fine purveyors or bookstores right now. Yes. All right, Sarah, thanks so much. Good luck with the tool good luck with the book and uh it's a great story so thanks so much for talking to me thank you so much matthew